What's going on YouTube Metal Complex here and today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to do with you guys. This is the Freeman Knives 451 button lock. You can see there button lock. That is super cool. I've got a lot to say about this knife. Just to let you guys know this knife was lent to me for review by my good pal Shaker. Uh, you can give him a follow on Instagram at ShakerMT1970. Thanks so much Shaker. I really appreciate the opportunity to look at this. Um, so these kind of gained traction uh, here, I want to say it was like, what was it, like a year ago or so that these kind of started to gain traction. I remember looking at it, that's, that's, that's a good looking knife. That's a heavy duty looking knife. What, it, what caught my eye were these lines right here. And just so you guys know, I know a lot of people are wondering, can you feel them? Yes, you definitely can feel them. I don't think that uh, lines like that are going to cause any sort of additional drag, though I don't think that they'll necessarily cause or, or give you any sort of advantage in cutting. I could be wrong. Um, it is aesthetically pleasing to me. It will not uh, necessarily be pleasing for everybody. Those of you who are new to my channel, I like to do knife reviews, knife overviews, unboxings, discussion topics. Uh, I upload every single day. So if that sounds good to you, make sure you subscribe. I also have Patreon. There's a link down in the description where you can take a look around. Uh, you can get stickers and there's also Patreon exclusive content offered to any tier. So if you'd like a shout out, uh, want me to plug your Instagram, your YouTube, um, or say something funny or ridiculous, uh, if you join my Patreon right now, I will do that for you if you'd like. The support would mean the world to me. Anyways, let's go ahead and get a measurement here of this guy. So overall length, of the 451 coming in, it's pretty big. 8.75 inches is what I'm getting. From tip to scale on the blade, you're probably looking at about 3.75 inches. The actual cutting edge, right on three and a half, maybe 3.4 on the cutting edge. There is sort of a forward choil there. We'll talk about that. How about some size comparisons? Up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. Rat 1 is coming in at 8.6 inches overall. So you can see there the Freeman uh, absolutely a larger knife. How about up against the Spyderco PM2? Spyderco PM2 is coming in at 8.3 inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Griptilian, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? The Ritter Hogue coming in at 8 inches overall. And last but not least, the Spyderco Para 3. Spyderco Para 3 coming in at 7.5 inches overall. Uh, let me go ahead and give you guys an example of the action. This is running on bearings, and like most modern button locks, it has an absolutely free drop action. As you can see here, Shaker has actually been using this. Um, this is a well-loved knife. It actually looks like it has been resharpened. Um, but uh, this part right here apparently used to uh, be DLC, and Shaker let me know that he actually stripped that away himself. Um, so, but you can get them like this in this exact configuration. I, I imagine what happened is the shaker saw uh, one like this and thought, you know what, I could probably strip some of that DLC away myself, and then he ended up doing that. Um, I think he did a pretty good job. Um, this is definitely a user though, uh, and I wanted to point that out because the action is still plenty smooth. Very good detent, very good flipping action. It feels very similar to a hinderer, not just on the flip, but the weight of the flip, also the shape of the flipper tab. That's very hindery. In fact, let me say this right now. This knife, the best way to describe it is um, imagine if a Microtech SOCOM Elite and a Rick Hinderer XM18 had a baby and it was a button lock. Um, that's what this feels like, honestly. That is very, I mean, it's the, the sort of aluminum handle feel versus weight of the blade shape of the flipper tab. Um, that's kind of the vibe that I'm getting here. Uh, and I, I think that's a good way to describe that. But anyways, the action is great. Uh, I have no issues with the action whatsoever. Uh, let me go ahead and give you guys a measurement here of blade thickness. We do have a fairly thick blade. 150, we're gonna say between 150 and 155 thousandths. Put it up against the Hinder XM18 so you guys can see here again why I feel um, it, it feels very hindery. You can see there the jimping is kind of in the same place. Blade stock thickness, very similar all the way out to the tip. Very thick. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, but it does come down to a pretty darn good cutting edge. This is definitely not going to be a uh, an apple slicer. This is going to be more of a hard work knife. So I get people every day saying, that's too thick. You know, you can't, uh, you can't shave toilet paper with it and you can't. 
not all knives need to be that thin behind the edge. There are different applications for knives. Um, considering, um, you know, Harry's profession, um, or shaker, considering his profession and what he uses his knives for, um, I can understand him wanting a knife that's a little bit thicker behind the edge, but is still plenty thin enough to do um, some, of, some of your more delicate tasks. I'm definitely going to tackle your EDC stuff, no problem. Weight coming in at 5.26 ounces. That's not really a surprise considering how big the knife is, how thick the blade stock is, and we are looking at aluminum, 6061 T6 aluminum, but pretty darn thick slabs, and then we've got a G10 inlay in this. So, you know, that's going to be too too heavy for some people. Um, I always say consider carry profile alongside weight. So here it is up against two knives that have incredibly awkward carry profiles, in my opinion, that nobody ever seems to complain about. That's becoming a saying <laughs> on my channel. The Para 2 and the Para 3 folded up. You can see there where the, the, the hump occurs to make room for the opening hole. Uh, it creates an awkward carry profile in terms of height. Even with this knife having a flipper tab, I would say, you know, in terms of height, no issue there. In terms of thickness, we are looking at uh, quite a bit of additional thickness versus the PM2 uh, and the uh, Para, uh, the Para 3. Yeah, definitely thicker. Um, I did, uh, I did carry this just a little bit. Very, I, I didn't pull it out or you know, beat on it or anything like that. But I did just carry it uh, around town just to kind of see. Um, this is definitely a knife that's going to do well in jeans or you know. Like, re like regular pants, if you're somebody who wears athletic shorts every day or you're somebody who wears really tight, thin material pants, this is definitely not going to be the knife for you. But it does carry comfortably for how big it is. Um, the SOCOM Elite is very similar in overall length and mass, and I believe it weighs almost exactly the same. It's a little bit longer, but... Um, yeah, you know, if you're somebody who um, carries around the SOCOM Elite and you don't have a problem with it, I don't, not in jeans anyway, then you're probably not going to have an issue with the Freeman. Uh, moving on here, I think we've done all of our measurements. Let's go ahead and talk about materials. So on this particular one, we've got, like I said, the aluminum handles. We have sort of a coyote and black G10 inlay that's nicely textured. You do have an option for a ton of different inlays. I've seen like red and blue and I think green. They even have carbon fiber if you want to pay a little bit more. A um, whole bunch of different inlay options. Um, and then the steel on this guy is D2. I'm going to guess, guys, it's like I always say, because people are going to freak out. D2, oh, I've seen the price on those. No. Okay. So most of the time when an American company like Medford uses D2, it may not list it, but it's likely CPM D2. CPM D2 is the powder metallurgic form of D2 and is... A, a much, I mean, in terms of the the structure, the evenness of the, the grain structure is a better, it's the same composition as D2, but it is is uh, better in terms of its grain distribution. So you have the same type of performance, you know, the qualities like toughness uh, uh, has a good, uh, I'm sorry, D2 has good toughness properties. It's got pretty darn good edge retention properties if it's heat treated properly uh, and it's reasonably stainless. You get those same, those properties even across you know, uh, through the entire blade versus some areas being more or less of those things in the ingot form of the steel. I know that it doesn't list it. And truthfully, I don't know that for sure, but I did find that out about Medford knives and some other US manufacturers who are using D2. So if you're gonna get bent out of shape about them using D2 on a knife that costs this much money, um, just understand, number one, it's likely CPM D2. And also this knife is offered in CPM S35 VN. Truthfully, in terms of user steels between CPM D2 and CPM S35 VN, I think they're both perfectly fine. I don't have an issue with either of them. I probably would opt for S35 VN because I like a stainless blade, and S35 VN is a little bit easier to sharpen in my experience than D2, um, and it's got uh, a similar edge retention. So um, you can opt for D2. I'm sorry, S35 VN if you want to. Blade shape, super cool. It's got this little um, notch here. I don't know that that's actually deep enough to really catch debris. I mean, it's going to catch a little bit, but the edges around here are not that sharp. I'm sure you guys are wondering. Um, you're probably also wondering, can you use it to deploy the knife? Yes, you absolutely can if you get your finger in exactly the right place. It is a little hard to do the reverse flick with it, but again, if you get your finger in exactly the right place, it's more so with the, yeah, 
it's more so with the meat, not so much your fingernail, but with the meat of your finger and then sort of, I, I flicking it sort of up like that, you can do that. Um, it's way more convenient to just use the flipper. This is far and away the most convenient way to deploy the knife and retract it. In fact, button locks in general, I think this is what's making this knife so fun and cool and unique with me, is that we've got a pretty overbuilt heavy duty knife that has um, this button lock. Um, and uh, they did this really, really well. Sometimes with button locks, you get a little bit of play, up, down, left, or right. This thing is solid. This thing is bank vault solid. I am dead serious, guys. I cannot wrench that blade uh, in any direction to get even the slightest hint of blade plate. This thing locks up. It's hardcore. There's no detent lash also. And by detent lash, I mean when the uh, blade is sucked into the handle right there. The blade does not wiggle around. Some knives will have like a little bit of rattle that bothers me. This knife doesn't. Um, it's very easy to engage and disengage, and it's a lot of fun to play with. Anybody who has not played with a button lock knife, uh, I'm not saying you you have to go after this one, but button locks are cool. You know, there is an argument out there where people are like, well, they're, they hypothetically are not as strong as frame locks, liner locks. Uh, the triad lock, triad lock, I know. Yeah, triad lock's the strongest lock in the whole world. We all know. Um, some people say it's, it's not as strong. Um, as far as what you're going to be using your knife for, as far as knife uh, knife tasks, you know, tasks that are reasonable for a folding uh, knife, a button lock is going to serve you just fine. Um, if you manage to break your button lock, what you were doing with your knife was probably not a knife task. So that's kind of trivial in my book, but it, it's circumstantial. It depends on what people are doing with their knives. Anyways, check out these lines. That's super cool. Uh, it reminds me of a Ruffles potato chip. Um, it's really nice. It's uh, it's pleasing. Like I said, I don't know that it would create any additional drag while you're cutting. Um, it's just cool. Uh, it makes a knife, I don't know, it kind of, for me, it kind of gives this knife an alligator vibe. Um, it just looks tough. You know, this looks like a straightforward, tough knife. And I think that's exactly what it is. I don't know how I feel about Freeman being right here, but I mean, it's unmistakably, I mean, this knife, I've seen it so often, the combination of, of course, Freeman, I mean, it's, it's, that sounds dumb. You can tell this knife is a Freeman, you know, because it says Freeman on it. No, <laughs> um, really, the big giveaways are uh, the shape and these uh, these ridges here. The um, I You know, I'm going to feel really stupid if somebody points out that they actually do have um, some sort of use or there's a reason that they put them on there. Um, I'm not saying, uh, you know, indefinitely that that's just an aesthetic feature. The truth is, is that I don't know and it's an identifying factor for me. When I see those and I see the overall profile of this knife, even without the word Freeman being there, if it was on this side, I'd go, ah, that's a Freeman. It's the 451 that I forget about. Um, but um, yeah, that's fine. On the other side, you can see it says USA D2 or if you choose USA S35VN. These are made in the United States. Keep that in mind. It seems that every day on my channel, somebody jumps in to say, you know, it's a shame. Uh, it's shameful that insert whatever US manufacturer is charging X amount for this knife. While we and um, who insert whatever high-end Chinese production company is making it for X amount. Guys, we is not they're not doing anything charitable with their prices. Just so everybody knows. I mean, I felt like people already knew this, but just so everybody knows, um, labor and manufacturing costs less in China. So these ultra high-end knives that you're getting from these Chinese manufacturers, they're fantastic, but they're not giving you these prices out of the kindness of their hearts. You know, they're not like trying to strike down the corporate greed of these American production companies. No, it costs more to make to produce an American knife. Now I'm sure that people are going to jump down my throats about that, but that's why it's it's not it's not because you know for reasons I just explained. That's that's the deal here. So um, yeah, this is going to be a little bit more expensive than some people want to pay, but for a lot of people, it's going to be right on the money. We'll keep talking about that here. Um, like I said, I think the blade shape is going to do just fine for your sort of outdoor hard use cutting tests that you might ask of a folding nice knife. Of course, use your discretion. Um, when it comes the uh, time to use a fixed blade, use a fixed blade. Um, all of these uh, uh, corners here have been nicely knocked down. Um, no issue whatsoever. A little bit of something green on there a little bit. <laughs> Shaker's been using this knife. So yeah, everything's been nicely knocked down. By the way, plenty of thickness out to the tip. Um, not a tip that's going to be easily broken in D2 or S35BN. Coming down to the scales here, it's kind of nice. Check out how they've done this here. It's chamfered, but it's also sort of 
been carved in. I'm sure there's a word for that and I'm, I'm just not coming up with it, but it, it's, it's nice to the touch. It's nicely knocked down. Um, let's take a look at the size of the hardware here. We'll go ahead and get out my handy dandy Wea bit selector. I'm going to guess the pivot is at least T8. We'll try T9 and T10 for the pivot and I'm going to guess T8 for the body screws as well as my Wea magnetic bit, magnetic bit selector. You can find these items down in my description. I've got links uh, for uh, maintenance items like like these. And then I've also got links for some of the cool knives that I show every single day, uh, whether they are some more expensive high-end production knives or knives in the budget category. I've got everything categorized out down there. It's neatly sorted, sort of a little mini shop uh, for those of you who are looking to scratch your itch. Whatever your itch is, I've got something down there for everybody. So make sure you check out my description. Uh, let's try first, oh, that's T9. Looking through my camera, here's T10. Let's try T10. These are so inexpensive, the uh, magnetic driver and bit selector. I know you guys hear that every day, but I just love them. Uh, yeah, that's at least a T10. Let's try one size up. Is that, could it be a, wait. Well, the next size up in, in here is T15. That's definitely gonna be too big. So yeah, I'm gonna say that's T10, but it kind of, I wanna show you guys here. Uh, it fits, yeah, it's pretty snug. We're gonna call that T10, so that's great. Um, body screws, actually, yeah, I'm gonna say that those are likely T8. Let's try that right there. Yeah, T8, awesome, awesome, that's great. So, um, for anybody who's new, I cannot stand T6. Uh, I hate that. T6 always, or it seems to uh, strip out pretty easily and uh, either the head or the bit. Um, I know you, know, you know, you get a higher quality bit, you don't have to worry about that as much, but T6 screws strip out. T8 is just easier. Uh, some people make the argument that depending on the design, a T6 screw is more aesthetically appealing. I don't care about that. I want my screws, you know, I want them easy to, uh, you know, to access and, and remove. Now you do have a lot of screws. You have the pivot, you've got three screws holding the inlays in, and then you have two body screws, two standoffs. Um, I. You know, the inlay is cool, but I think just to reduce parts and overall cost, I might have just preferred some texturing on the handle, on the aluminum, and no inlay whatsoever. Um, now, some people are going to argue with me on that. Some of you are like, well, the inlay op offers an opportunity for contrast, you know, with all the different colors. And yeah, I can I can see that, you know. So I'm just saying, from for me, I, I probably would prefer just texturing on the aluminum, and that way I eliminate um, three additional body screws. See kind of how they've got it on this side? I'd have been fine with that on this side. Now, I don't know if they offer a version of it like that. The only versions I have ever seen are the versions with the inlays. Maybe they do, in which case I'm just saying things that don't matter. <laughs> The only versions I could find were versions with the inlay, so perhaps somebody can enlighten me down in the comments section. Um, but either way, I kind of like this too. Uh, we've got a nice uh, area for a lanyard. You can see Shaker's got his own lanyard on there. We have two very, very Rick Hinderer style uh, standoffs. Let's should take a look at actual Rick Hinderer standoffs. Extremely similar to Rick Hinderer standoffs. Um, I like how that looks though. We've got some more jimping back here. The jimping is not aggressive. Um, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people are probably wondering, does it have an issue with the landing zone? Not nearly the same issue as an XM18. This has got a sharp landing zone and that will bother your finger after a while. On the Freeman, not so much. It's a lot smoother. They've got those corners knocked down quite a bit. It's just a lot more pleasant on the fingers. Um, nice, uh, open body construction, easy to clean out. Just pr like perfect centering or nearly perfect centering considering Shaker has used this. Um, fantastic. Like I said, bank vault lockup. Really cool, really fun knife to use. Um, so here is uh, the price on this. Right now you can find it. I, I did a quick search and found them on USMA Blade in D2 and a, a few different colors of G10 inlay for about $225. Um, and then you can get the ones with the carbon fiber inlays for about $255. And then I found some past pricing online with some S, because I couldn't find any S35VN versions of this knife in stock, but I found some versions of it uh, in S35VN and carbon fiber for about $285. So I'm guessing you're going to find this knife anywhere from $225 to about $285. I don't think those are bad prices. You know, if somebody told me, hey, you can get this, uh, this Freeman 
um, with uh, S35VN and a G10 inlay or carbon fiber inlay, because with me, I don't really care, um, right around the $250 mark. I think I'd be okay with that. You know, there were a couple of places online where I saw this knife over $300. I don't know that I'd, I'd feel comfortable paying any more than about $285. $250, sign me up. $285, uh, uh, I'm okay. I, I think I, I might be able to do that. $300, no, I'm not gonna do that. I saw one website list in, listing an S35VN model that looked just like this blade. It was two-tone uh, and had a carbon fiber inlay for $325. I think that's a little bit too high, even considering that this knife is made in the United States. Um, but uh, for a US made uh, production knife with these materials, this action, you know, like I said, it does run on bearings, it locks up hard, um, very dependable. You know, a lot of people are gonna say, well, it's a, you know, is aluminum really all that durable? Is the button lock really all that durable? The knife has clearly been handling everything shakers thrown at it, and it certainly feels like an overbuilt, dependable cutting tool. So yeah. I think I can go ahead and say I can recommend this knife. And again, people who want to get all up in arms about the whole D2 thing, um, they do offer them an S35VN. So I couldn't find any at the moment, but that doesn't mean that they're not going to do more in the future. Um, I think these are great knives. I think they're very well built. I don't know that I really have any complaints. We didn't talk about the pocket clip. Um, it, it would be nice if they had at least a mounting position on the other side. And the other issue is that it carries a little bit shallow. It's right there on the line where it's like, yeah, that's quite a bit sticking up. They made room for the lanyard hole. And truthfully, I mean, I know Shaker's got one on here. Um, if it were me, I would just ditch the lanyard hole altogether and move the pocket clip up. Um, different handle shape than on the Hinder XM18, but you can see there the lanyard hole is back here and the pocket clip is moved up so that it carries a little bit deeper. Not the best example on the XM18, but you can see it carries much deeper than the Freeman. It would have been nice to move this up and just put the lanyard hole back here and make a little oval or something like that, but I don't know. You know, it's not really that big of a deal. I, I would say that that might be one of the downsides. The other downsides for people in general is um, it's just going to be a big, thick knife. You know, the knife is going to be too big for some people to carry in certain states. And it's also going to be too thick and too heavy for a lot of people. But that's circumstantial. You know, the only thing that I think is going to be universally annoying about this knife is the fact that the pocket clip carries a little deep. As far as pocket clip functionality, though, it actually feels very similar to a Hinder XM18 pocket clip and kind of, kind of looks the same. It's not exactly the same. It's wider at the top, but you guys kind of see what I mean there. Um, overall, yeah, I think this is a great knife. Oh, here's something else I want to point out. It does have a, um, a spanner, uh, thing on the other side there. Um, a lot of people get kind of bent out of shape about that. They're like, what if it free spins? You need some sort of proprietary, that's proprietary hardware. You need some spin. You don't, you don't need a spanner bit costs about a buck 50 at your local hardware store. You can also cut a notch in a penny. I've done that before. Um, but, uh, or you can cut a notch in any, you know, what, whatever, uh, light material, or light uh, metal, um, you guys know what I'm trying to say. Uh, not not difficult. Shouldn't be difficult to disassemble. Um, I uh, yeah, I think uh, I think this is great. So, anyways, this is going to go on my most recommended knives playlist. But I think that's going to be pretty much it for today's video, guys. Shaker, thank you so much again. I appreciate you letting me take a look at this. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do of course have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on this Metal Complex logo right here and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.